So once again, welcome to Calvary Chapel Osmond Trail. And this morning we have a, a privilege to do something that doesn't happen too often. We're going to ordain uh, David. And uh, he is uh, a guy that we met in the cold, uh, standing in, was it five hour, yeah, six hours, like <laughs> five or six hour line just to buy in and out burger. <laughs> And, uh, uh, and the funny thing, the ironic thing about it is uh, I had just had In-N-Out Burger uh, while traveling. I was traveling through Texas, and I, I got me a burger, and I was, I was perfectly content not to stand in line when they first opened here in Colorado. Uh, but my wife and my daughter, who was not with me on my travels, uh, when In-N-Out showed up, they're like, oh, we got to get an In-N-Out Burger. And, uh, of course, uh, we, I said, okay, and so we drove over to In-N-Out, and there was a line of cars that went all the way around the block, a uh, very large block, and we got uh, probably about a quarter of the way into the line uh, from the In-N-Out to, and we're just following the line back, and I stopped, and I said, hey, how long have you guys been waiting? And they said, uh, we've been out here for like seven hours or something like that. And they were towards the front of the line. And I, and I looked at the line and I realized how far back it went. And I thought, no, I, I'm not waiting in this car for that long. Uh, and so I decided, well, I'll park the car and we'll, and we'll go stand in line. And it was very cold that day. Um, I mean... That was cold. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was freezing cold. And of course I showed up in, in flip-flops and and whatnot, you know, I was just, I was ready for the, the summer, you know, uh, and uh, anyways, so as as things would have it, you know, I talked to everybody. Anybody not know this? <laughs> and of course, of course, I talked to these guys, and uh, uh, we're just talking uh, about all kinds of things in life, about uh, ministry, about Bible, and, and several hours into the conversation, uh, Patty says, hey, do you go to church around here? I'm like, well, actually I do. And at the time I was a, a pastoral intern at Rocky Mountain Calvary down here off of Academy. And it's a, a rather large church, a couple thousand. And uh, they says, oh, we go there too. So it turns out we went to the same church, didn't even know it. Um, but uh, and we started up a friendship. And from that point, I, I invited Dave uh, to join me in a Saturday morning's men breakfast where we would have breakfast and we'd go through the Word of God verse by verse. And so I've had an opportunity uh, to kind of disciple him a little bit over the, yeah. over the uh, about a year and a half, two year yeah, time frame. Two years, yeah. And uh, just saw God moving in his life and uh, really his uh, understanding of the scriptures was uh, spot on. And uh, he just very consistent in showing up to each week. Uh, and there were times where it's just Dave and I. And nobody else would show up, but they would show up. And, you know, there were times when we had 15, 20 people, and there was times it was just me and Dave. But uh, I saw his consistency. And, uh, and so when we started, uh, of course, we started here at Aspen Trail uh, a year and a half ago, and about Four months ago, we, we started Calvary Chapel Aspen Trail uh, formally, where we got our own 501c3, and we kind of branched out on our own as our own uh, independent church. And part of doing that is having uh, developing a board of elders. And so I have uh, we got uh, uh, if you look at our 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 bulletins on the back, I list all of our board of elders, uh, the members of our board of elders. Um, and they were all, they're all pastors at other churches with the exception of Dave. And it says pastor on there, but, uh, and, uh, you know, maybe a little bit premature, but it's, it was step out in faith when we wrote it. <laughs> but anyways, and so my intent has always been to ordain Dave. Um, when I look at the scriptures, uh, and I'm going to read them here in a second. Um, I want, I'm going to read the qualifications of both the elders and a deacon. 
okay? And uh, and then we'll go, and then, then I'm gonna say a few words and then we're gonna pray over, over Dave, okay? So uh, 1 Timothy, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 3. It says, This is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Now let me stop right there for a second. Bishop, the word bishop, the word overseer, elder, pastor, these words are synonymous with each other. All, all the words mean the same. Okay? And so, for an elder, for an overseer, a bishop, if a person desires the position of bishop, he desires a good word. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, uh, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not ready for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, so it can't be a new believer, not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Verse 8 goes into qualifications of a deacon. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mysteries of the faith with pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, and let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives, Patty, their wives must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, the qualifications for the elders and qualifications for deacons are very similar. There's only a few exceptions to these qualifications that distinguish elders from deacons. Now, when I read through these qualifications, I see these qualifications in Dave. Had I not seen these 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 attributes, these qualifications in Dave, I never would have asked him to sit on our on our board, and I, and I, we wouldn't be ordaining him this morning. Uh, and so, uh, when I look at the differences between the two elders and deacons, the only differences between the two, there's really kind of three. Three differences. Number one, when it comes to deacons, it also mentions the wives. The wives need to be in check, not gossips, not, you know, slanderers. But, you know, and, and I just read all the qualifications uh, of the wife. And so one of the rare exceptions where, you know, a lot of times when we go to, we get jobs in life, you know, uh, you become a police officer, a politician, a, a school teacher, a musician, you know, you go for a job interview, they're interviewing you, right? Well, when it comes to deacons, the interview is of, of not just the deacon, but the deacon's spouse as well. One of the few exceptions. Uh, but the other two differences between elders and deacons is in the issue of drinking is one of them. If you notice here, qualifications of, of, uh, of a elder is not given to wine. For deacons, not given to much wine. <laughs> so evidently, deacons can drink occasionally, not a lot, but elders, they're not, or pastors, they're not allowed to drink, according to what I'm reading here in Timothy. They take, for the elders, they take the word much out, not given to wine. For deacons, it's not given to much wine, right? Uh, and then the only other difference between the two is that elders have to have the ability to teach. 
They have to have the ability to teach. Now, in the scriptures, we're all commanded to teach. Like, wait, wait a minute, Tom, what are you talking about? What do you mean I'm commanded? Yeah, I'm not a teacher, right? Uh, let's see, uh, are you a teacher? No. <laughs> all right, real quick, you did, no hesitation there. Uh, Jim, what about you? Are you a teacher, brother? You go, yeah, I'm a teacher. How about you, brother? Uh, Kurt? I've taught. You've taught, but are you a teacher? Would you, would you think you're a teacher? Small amount. Well, check it out. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible teaches. The Great Commission. Go, therefore, into all the nations, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey the commandments of the Lord. Right? That's, that was to, the, that was, that's to all Christians. That, that, the Great Commission is for all Christians, Right? Right in in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter six, it says we got to be diligent to teach our kids the commandments of the Lord, right? And so we all have a a command to teach the Word of God. But with elders, they got to be gifted at teaching. They have to have the ability to teach, right? And so these are really the only differences between elders and deacons. I had every intent this morning to ordain David as an elder. I've seen him grow as a Christian. He's not a young believer, right? And I've, I've reasoned with him through the scriptures and he has an understanding of scriptures. I've asked him to preach here previously and, and he is uh, done so willingly uh, uh, at my request, probably not so willingly in his own spirit because he's uh, nervous. And even this morning, I'm going to have him preach today and next week, and and he admittedly says, "Well, I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm not that guy. I'm 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 more of a behind the scenes guy." But here's the reality: every one of us by design are behind the scenes. Because it's not me as Pastor Tom that is doing any of this. It's not even Pastor Darrell who ordained me. It's not Billy Graham, it's not, you name the, you name the preacher, it's not the preacher. It's Christ in us. Christ in us, amen? It's Christ in us. So many times you know, I felt inept in my preaching. And yet God uses it nonetheless. And so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna move this over here and I'm gonna have Dave stand up over here. And I just read through the scriptures. In fact I'm gonna have the gentleman come on up here. Dudley, if you can come up here. Chuck, brother, Dick, come on up here. David. In Acts chapter 6, there was a dispute between the uh, Hebrews and the Hellenist Jews about food distribution. And they were complaining. And this is, and this is where they, they first come up with the ideas of deacons. And it's the idea, you know, the Apostle Paul and Peter and the other disciples are like, should we take ourselves away from preaching the Word of God to wait on tables? He says, no, we need to raise up, you pick seven among you, to raise up some deacons to, to serve the physical needs of the church so that as the apostles and the disciples, the elders, the pastors, they can dedicate themselves to the spiritual needs of the church, preaching the Word of God. And so... In obedience to what they did there in Acts chapter 6. They found seven men, they brought and they laid hands on them and they prayed over them to commend them to the service of the work of God. As a deacon or as an elder, we are not entering a life of privilege, but a life of service. It's one of the things I like about not getting paid. 
as a pastor here at Calvary Chapel Aspen Trail because it truly is a earmark of my heart to serve. And I know that Dave has the same type of heart. Whenever I ask him to do anything, if he's not traveling for his civilian job, he's always right there. And he's got a wife that supports him in his service to our community. And so that's an encouragement to me. And so Dave, understanding the qualifications of an elder and a deacon, uh, is it your desire to serve God in that manner? Yes, it is. Then we'll, we're going to have the men here come around him, come on in, lay hands on you. And as a church, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for David. If you can't reach him, touch a brother next to you, and then uh, we got a chain reaction going here. Amen? Seven. All right, let's, let's pray for David. Father God, we just thank you so much that, that David has a heart for you, for your word, and for your people. That there's no hesitation when, when called to serve. I'm so gr grateful to call him my brother and to have him come alongside me as a pastor of this church to serve your people. Lord, I pray a blessing in his life. Not just in his life, but in the life of his wife and kids. That as a family, they would serve you together. And that as a man, that he would serve this church well. Not looking for accolades, not looking for a pat on the back but simply to bring you honor and glory through his testimony of having Christ shine brightly in his life. Lord, I pray that, that David would be an imitator of you and that others would hope to imitate David just as also he imitates you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, by the power of your spirit, Lord. Amen. Amen. David, uh, I want to give you here, this is a little certificate of ordination. So basically, it says that uh, uh, Calvary Chapel Aspen Trail is ordaining you as a deacon. Uh, maybe here shortly in the future, if we might erase that, white it out, and put elder. I don't know. But uh, just remember. I know your heart is to be behind the scenes. You don't want to be seen. You want to be that, that mover and shaker from behind the scenes, be, behind the curtain, if you will. But every one of us, every one of us is behind the scenes because it, Christ and Christ alone is front and center. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, on top of that, I also want to give you this gift from the church. It's a coffee mug. Uh, it says, a man's heart plans his course, but the Lord directs his steps right uh and so that's a little gift from the church uh and so let's let's uh, let's uh just give god a, a praise offering a round of applause yeah. Amen. i love you brother and so his first official act as uh, deacon of our church, uh, because I do believe he has the ability to teach, I'm going to have him, I'm going to turn the pulpit over to him this morning, and he's going to preach. Uh, we're going to continue our study, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, you guys can sit down. Um, he's going to continue our study in the book of Genesis, preaching verse by verse, and uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and then uh, what he doesn't finish today on uh, chapter 18, 19. 19, what he doesn't finish today in chapter 19, he'll pick up next week as well. So, David, it's all you, brother. Thank you, sir. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, so, like Pastor Tom says, uh, my name's Dave Bilberry, and it's been a while since we were here last, unfortunately. Um, probably it's been about a year. Um, and it's just been 
a whirlwind for our family. Um, like Pastor Tom says, uh, I'm actually by um, my civilian's job is I like to stand. <laughs> but we've got to keep you on video. All right. um, so I'm a, actually a, a network technician um, with a DOD contractor. And this last year, we've been, just been traveling constantly. And, you know, we have four kids, so they kind of keep us on our toes. Uh, and last time I was here, I actually had two hip replacements. So I'm like brand spanking new almost. Uh, doing good on that. Uh, just a quick testimony on me, uh, for those who don't know me or, or for those who do know me, but might have forgot so it's been so long. Um, I didn't come to Christ until I was about 35. And before that, I was a mess, if I really, to be honest. Uh, God came into my wife's and our lives at about the same time. And after I got saved, I looked back and I noticed that God was constantly with me. He was even with me in my unbelief. And when I was in my unbelief, I didn't like religion because I thought it was people trying to control the people. And once I got saved, I realized, <laughs> right, religion kind of is that way. But when you're a Christian, you're in a relationship with Christ. It's not religion. It's a relationship. It's like a relationship that I have with my, my wife, my kids, my friends. It's totally different. Um, God has definitely blessed me with a wonderful wife. Um, I'm definitely married up. <laughs> Uh, and blesses with four wonderful kids. And so it's just been great. Um, like Pastor Tom says, uh, I'm kind of an introvert, kind of guy behind the scenes. So this takes a lot for me to do sometimes. But like he says, we're all equipped to teach. We're all supposed to be doing this. Um, so any one of us can really be doing this. Even one of us could be standing up here and preaching God's word. Uh, so I, to, be, so if, to be honest, Full transparencies. I've never gone to seminary school. I've never gone to disciple school. Never had any formal training. The only training I have is being in the Word of God. I'm in the Word of God daily. I'm praying. Uh, he, no matter how many times I read Genesis, no matter how many times I read chapter 19, it speaks differently to me because it's in the Word I'm at in my life. So this is the living Word of God. So, um, okay, enough about me. Uh, let's get into our study. So. How many of you have heard the word going along to get along? Has anyone heard that phrase before? Show hands. Just give me a quick hand. Okay, what does that mean? What does that mean, going along to get along? Kind of means, okay, I'm not really believing what you're saying. It's kind of going against my beliefs, but I'm going to go ahead and go along with you guys so I don't create any problems. I don't create. Um, get people getting mad at me, getting people upset with me, having drama. But what we're going to see in today's study with Lot, he actually kind of did that. He kind of compromised his beliefs and started going into the ways of Sodom in that wicked city. You know, with Lot, he walked with Abraham. He understood that, you know, God talked to Abraham directly and that he saw the, the things that God did in Abraham's life. He pulled him out of Ur, out of his homeland, into a land they did not know, into Canaan. And at that time, Lot saw everything. God prospered Abraham. He prospered, prospered Lot so much that the land couldn't sustain him, so they had to separate. They had to go their separate ways. And Abraham goes, Lot, you get to choose. Where do you want to go? And Lot looks out, and he goes, eh, you know, that area over there looks pretty good. You know, it's got nice little fields, a nice little stream, some, some water. I'm going to go there. So Lot separates from Abraham, who's walking with God. And he goes on his own. And he goes down to by Sodom. Now, this is kind of an example of Lot, Lot wasn't living a testimony and resting in the Lord. And yet, he started embracing the ways of the world. And so, kind of the thing that I, when I studied this, this passage, is like, we got to be aware of compromising our beliefs or going along to get along with the ways of the world. So let's get into um, chapter 19, verse 1. So it says, Now two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. So here we have the two angels from the previous chapter, chapter 18, right? We, we saw three angels come to Abraham, one was a pre-incarnated Christ, and they were, you know, that they told Abraham, hey, you're going to have a son, you're going to be blessed, and then God goes, well, shall I let Abraham know what I'm going to do to Sodom? 
go along with his two angels. And so that's where God goes, yep, I'm going to judge Sodom. I'm going to pretty much do away with it. And so this is where Abraham starts getting a debate with God about, hey, if there's 100 righteous people, you save it. And God suggests, and you're like, oh, okay, well, how about 50? How about 20? How about just 10? So I got, I'm sorry, I thought it was kind of amusing here he's debating with God. But basically what Abraham really wanted was, God, would you just save Lot and his family out of the city? That's, I think, what he really was trying to say to God. But he didn't say it directly. So now we have the two angels coming into the city of Sodom. Now, do you think Lot knew these guys were angels? Probably not. He won't find out. But right off the bat, he just sees these two guys coming up into the city. And but where's Lot at? Lot's at the city gate. And back in those times, all the officials were at the city gate. So what this is saying, telling us is that Lot's a prominent person in Sodom, in this wicked city. And you got to think, you know, Sodom, or excuse me, Lot probably didn't go straight from Abraham straight into the city. He kind of went near the city, then he started pitching his tent by the city, and now we see him not only in the city, but as a higher official of the city. Um, and this probably took about maybe 25 years between when he left Abraham until the time he's sitting here at the gate. So let's go continue in verse 2. Um, and he said, Here now, my lords, please turn in your servant's house and spend the night. Wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And he said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly. So they turned to him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. So I'm wondering when Lot saw these two guys coming up to the city gate, if he was kind of surprised. Because I'm sure at this time that Sodom probably had a bad reputation in the region. That, hey, if you're traveling through, through the area, the last place you want to stay is in Sodom. And so he's probably going, whoa, what are these guys doing here? So he probably rushed out, said, hey, guys, why don't you come into my house? Because at that time, the custom was that if, if there were travelers that came through, you open them in your house, care for them, make sure they were comfort, fed them. And not only that, but they're under your protection. So you're responsible for these people. And Lot, Lot probably knew, or I'm sure Lot knew exactly what would happen to these guys if he let them stay out in, in the open square. That they would be in serious trouble and their lives would pretty, pretty much in jeopardy. So as we continue in verse 4, Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surround the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them carnally. So, what it seems like, Sodom's chief sin is homosexuality. And not only that, but being very violent. Because these guys wanted to just sexually assault these two guys that just came into their city. And it shows the kind of death and depravity and the corruption and sinfulness of Sodom. And it's prevalent throughout the city because it's just, it's, I mean, it's not just five or six guys that are doing this. It's the whole entire town. We have old and young, and they came from every quarter, every region of this town they came. So we're talking maybe 50, 100 guys out there. And so my question is, how did God, how did Lot, end up like this? How did he become a, a prominent citizen of a, of a town that is, is wicked when he knew what it's like to be walking with God, walking with Abraham, or when he was walking with Abraham? And basically, I feel like he entered a bargain with the world, and he started drifting away from God. Basically, he traded his peace of mind and the quiet life of men of faith for a word of success and comfort. And this is a kind of a prime example that we all face as believers when we start marrying ourselves to the world or start accepting the ways of the world and not staying firm in our beliefs and our convictions. So not only was Lot distancing himself from God, he was also putting his family and himself in jeopardy, not just spiritual jeopardy, but physical jeopardy as well as we'll see. So verse 6. 
So Lot went out to them through the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brethren, do not be so wickedly. Now see, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may know them as you wish, or do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. Okay, I'm going to have to be totally honest. Being the father of two beautiful girls, this passage disturbed me deeply. I cannot understand what Lot is thinking here. I, I, I can't fathom putting my girls in harm's way for two complete strangers. And I was trying to, and I studied this, and I was trying to figure out any kind of reason or anything that would be logical why he would do this. And the only thing I found was that he, he's worried about his reputation. His, he was responsible for the safety of these men that were in his house. And yet he was so worried, so concerned about keeping this cultural morality or, or cultural norm that he was willing to sacrifice his family for this. You know, and so he was definitely compromised by being in Sodom. He was, he was sitting there and he got to a place where he thought this was an option. And so my question is, do we do that now? Do we offer our, our kids to the world? Do our grandkids, our great grandkids? Do we let, do we say okay to sin? Do we just say, oh, that's fine, they're just kids being kids? You know, it's it's very disturbing that you get to a place where, you, where you're willing to offer your kids. Um, so, another thing that I find kind of disturbing about this, or, or kind of unique, is that Lot calls them brethren, brothers. Now, I use that term all the time. I use it with my friends, people I love, people I know. I call Tom my brother. I call my friends my brothers. I call all you my brothers and sisters in Christ because I have a connection with you. I respect your values. I respect the way you, you are, the way you guys live your lives. So here's Lot going, brethren, my brothers. I'm one of you. I want to be just like you, it seems like. And it, and it just breaks my heart that he, he he's so, so influenced by the world, so worried about his reputation that he's willing to do this. And it's just like he wants, it seems like he wants more of a connection with these guys than with the truth. So then as we go on, in verse 9, and they said, this is the, the mob, Stand back. Then they said, This one came in, in to stay here, and he kept calling, acting like a, as a judge. Now we would deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man, Lot, and came near to break down the door. So here's Lot, worried about his reputation, calling these men brothers, supposed to be kind of being one with these guys. And as soon as he calls sin, sin, as soon as he says these guys are being wicked, they turn on him. So here he is, worried about all this, and as soon as he says something that they don't like, they turn on him. And so why is he even worried about his reputation about this? They obviously don't care about protecting travelers that come in under your house. They don't care about this, but he does. He calls what they want to do to these men a sin. And so as brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, when we come conforming to the world just a little, we gotta be careful. Because once we make it wait, once we make a stand for something, the world will turn on us as well. We're already seeing that. If we call homosexuality a sin, if we call transgender not right, if we call trans, you know transgender operations on little kids without the parents being involved not right, the world what do they call us? They call us uncaring, hypocrites, uh, uh, bigots, unloving. We see it. We see them get involved in the churches already. We're seeing gay pastors, gay marriages being performed. That's not what God says. It should be right. That's not, that's going totally against God's word. We have to understand what sin is and we have to call it for what it is. Now, don't get me wrong. We're all sinners. But 
trust me, before I came to Christ, I was a sinner. And like I said before, God was with me even in my sinfulness. He was there for me. I broke God's heart in my sinful, just like homosexual breaks his heart for me in theirs. He wants them to be redeemed. He cares for these people. And so if God cares for these people, we should care for these people as well. We need to bring hope and, and love to these people to show them the love of Christ. Because without it, they are truly lost. Jesus went. If Jesus was here today in the flesh, where would he be? He'd definitely be in the community of homosexuals. He'd definitely be in the communities of, of, of people who are very sinful. Because that's what he did when he was walking the earth. Um, we should, so as Christians, we should always show the love to others by sharing the gospel and the good news that Christ forgives our sins. And once we're forgiven our sins and accept the Holy Spirit in our souls, the Holy Spirit works miraculous and can change anybody. He changed me. Um, and so in verse 10, but the man reached out, these are the angels, reached out their hands and pulled the light into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. So I think this is what sin does to us sometimes. You know, sometimes we're so lost in our sin, so blinded by our sin, that we continue to be going along in our sin, and we're still reaching out for it. I mean, these guys were blinded by sin, and yet they still try, were trying to find the door. Children still trying to get out of them. And they did it for so long that they grew weary, that they just got tired of it and gave up. But it wasn't like five minutes. It was probably hours that these guys were trying to still try to satisfy their lust. Um, so it's just amazing that sometimes when we're in our sins, that it's no wonder we're tired. No wonder we're, we're just weary in it. I got a saying, I go, when, when I start learning from God, I start getting stressed and, and depressed. Because if you really look at the world and what's going on in the world today, you know, if you watch the news for any times, I start feeling stressed. And then after a while, I start getting depressed. But once I turn to God and go, it says it in the Bible exactly what's going on in the world today. So I find my comfort there. I know that God's in control. Not me, not Pastor Tom, not any one of us. But God's in control of everything. And so that's where I get my rest. So just in conclusion, you know, a lot is definitely an example of what happens to those who are saved by grace, but start compromising to the world. Here he is, knowing what God wants, knowing that God's real, and yet he starts wanting to be part of the world, start accepting the, the success, the, the allocates, the praise. Um, I'm sure that the first day Lot set foot in Sodom, that giving up his girls to a mob would never, ever cross his mind. He probably thought that was so apprehensible on day one. But after 20, 25 years of being in that constant field of, of sin and wickedness, it slowly wore him down where he thought it was an option. And that's just amazing to me. So I, I found this um, in my studies. It's a um, verse-by-verse -verse organization, and I forget the pastor's name, but he says, um, bargaining with the world is like sleeping with the enemy. You're walking along with something that wants to extinguish the light and hope that you have in you. It makes you weary, fighting all the time. You start losing your grounding. So we definitely need to make sure that we're always grounded in, in Christ, always grounded in the Bible. Um, if we associated ourselves with bias, vulgarity, crudeness, promiscuity, brutality, and materialism, we would, what will our spiritual condition be over time? Where will we be at in 20 years, 10 years, 5 years, a year? Will we be start to accept things that we know are sin and that we just feel that, oh, it's okay? Uh, you know, again, we need to make sure that we don't celebrate, promote, condone sin, no matter what it is. We should be this light in this dark world because it's getting darker every day. So as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ, the best way to combat this is by staying close to Christ and God's word. 
we need to be constantly in prayer for each other and our loved ones and for those who are lost. Uh, we also need to be renewing our minds daily in the Word of God. If you're not in the Word of God, how do you know what it means? How do you know what He's saying? Um, you know, we, you have pastors and elders coming up and, and teaching the Word of God, but you need to read this for yourselves as well because this is, will speak to you like no one else can. Uh, we need to also surround ourselves by other brothers and sisters in Christ because we will edify each other. We will comfort each other. We will be there for each other during the rough times. And we will also sharpen each other. So, but most of all, we still need to show this love and the compassion that Christ had for each one of us to this world, to this lost and dying world they so desperately needed. Um, so, in closing, I have a saying that says, "For I believe that there is no greater truth than God's love, and yet there's no greater love than God's truth. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. you song? <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Yeah. As we pass the communion, uh, I want us to marinate on some of what Dave has shared with us. I want us to think about the idea that that even though that Lot chose to go dwell in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible teaches that he was a righteous man, but yet because he chose to live where he lived, the Bible also says that we become like the people we hang around. And that's certainly what was happening with Lot. And if not for the intercessory prayer, the prayer of Abraham, it very well may be that, that, that God may have allowed Lot to be consumed with Sodom. But it's through Abraham's prayers that Lot and his family were saved. I want us to think about that. I want us to think about where are we at with God? Are we compromising? Are we allowing the world to consume us? Are we becoming like the world? Are we embracing the ways of the world? Are we standing firm in our faith? Are we being a light in a dark world? Are we being a testimony of God's love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness? This is what we need to ask ourselves. Take a, a moment just to marinate on that.
Father God, the Word teaches us that while in the upper room, Jesus took the bread and took the cup and used it as a, a symbol of a much greater message for his disciples and for, for us. They were relaxing around the dinner table, enjoying the meal together. And it was after the meal was over and they're reclining around the table, Jesus took the bread and he says, this is a symbol of my body that's to be broken for us. He says, as often as you take this bread, as often as you eat it, eat it in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup and he says, this is my blood of a new covenant. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. And of course, the bread and the cup became a symbol, an image, a picture of Christ undying love for us where he so willingly went to the cross allowed his blood or bread or excuse me allowed his body to be broken and his blood to be shed so that we could be cleansed so we could be made whole so that we could be reconciled to a holy and righteous God and so in humble obedience we now take Father God, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for being that ultimate sacrifice. We no longer have to take a lamb or a sheep to a priest to have it be sacrificed for the atonement of our sins. What you did on the cross some 2,000 years ago was the ultimate sacrifice to end all sacrifices. That simply by us putting our trust and our faith and our hope in you in the work that you did at Calvary allows us to be made right with a holy and righteous God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing song this morning Open the eyes uh, that I may see. Let's do all three.